morning. My name is Jeffrey Katz, and I'm the president of the Washington Map Society. And I'm delighted to welcome you all to this evening's program, which features Frank Manasek, who many of you may already know as the author of A Leading Guide to Map Collecting. And some, including myself, also may be familiar with his engaging novels grounded in the map collecting world. Um, tonight's program is the latest in our monthly program sponsored virtually by a partnership of seven map societies representing all parts of the country. I can name them the California, Chicago, New York, Philip Lee Phillips, Rocky Mountain, Texas, and uh, the Washington Map Society. All of these map societies are nonprofit organizations that support map collecting, cartography, and the study of cartographic history and are financial sponsors of this Zoom meeting. And if you're not a member of at least one of these societies, we hope you'll consider joining at least one of them. The benefits vary for each society. And here's my plug. Uh, members of the Washington Map Society receive three annual issues of the Portal On Journal, digital access to all past issues of the Portal On, digital access to past guest speaker lectures, and many other features in the members only section of the WMS website. And if you're not a member, uh, we have an introductory rate of $25 for the first year of a digital membership. Uh, we and our partner map societies would also like to thank our advertisers who support our groups and also help make possible the publication of our journals, the Portal On and Calafia, the journal of the California Map Society. So before we proceed further with tonight's program, um, underscore the usual housekeeping matters, please note that this lecture is being recorded. So please turn off your video and microphone if you do not want to be recorded. Uh, also, please use the chat feature to chat type questions and they will be addressed at the conclusion of the talk. And with that, I'd like to turn the program over to Ron Grimm the WMS Vice President and Program Chair. Ron? Hey, thank you, Jeff. Um, in consultation with uh, some of the other MAP societies, we have been developing a program uh, for the rest of the winter and the spring. Uh, we're just about ready to finalize that uh, program list, which will appear in the next issue of the Portal In, and I will be sharing it with the other MAP societies. Now, I'd like to, at this time, bring your attention to the next meeting, which will be uh, on January 5th on a Thursday, and our speaker will be Andrew Capuchunas, um, who is the secretary of the New York MAP Society. He's also a member of the Lithuanian Cartographic Society, and he's a retired data and processing consultant. Uh, the title of his talk is The Struggle of Mapmakers to Keep Up with the Changing Post-World War I Boundaries Between Lithuania and Poland. Yeah. Um, in that talk, he will examine uh, how maps and atlases public publishers struggled and I think that's probably going to be a strong word in his talk to depict European boundaries after World War I, especially in the area of Poland and Lithuania. And now it is my pleasure. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm having, uh, I think you can all see the screen. I'm having, a, I have a new laptop. I'm not pushing all the buttons right yet. Uh, our speaker tonight is uh, Frank Manasek. Uh, he's a retired professor uh, at Dartmouth Medical School. He's a former antiquarian map dealer, and he is the author of two map-related books, one uh, Collecting Old Maps, and more recently, a treatise on moon maps. Um, the title of his talk tonight is the birth of moon maps, um, looking through the telescope. And in this uh, presentation, he will focus on about 15 moon maps that were published between 1610 and 1696, shortly after the invention of the telescope. Um, so before I turn the 
program over to uh, Frank. Just if you have questions, type them in the chat feature and I will help uh, read and he will address the questions at the end of his presentation. And now uh, turn it over to Frank. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you for that nice introduction. I'm going to give this a, um, a try. Now, does that work? Yep. That's good, Frank. Very good. Oh, good. Oh, great. Fantastic. Um, this evening, I'm going to uh, illustrate some of the problems encountered when an instrument of natural philosophy, the telescope, revealed a truly new world that permits us, um, and this, this punctate beginning in 1610 permits us to witness the development of a mapping of a discreetly defined period of time of an entirely new world. And we can follow the uh, development, the evolution, the early development of a subset of, uh, of cartography. And we're all familiar with this. Uh, it's, it's my favorite old map actually. And it's a new world only because it was new to the Europeans. Everything could be um, shown on this map could be named, described by both European and the local inhabitants. The languages were quite adequate for everything seen on this, this map. And indeed the uh, historian Anthony Pagden noted that uh, Jose de Acosta, who was one of the Jesuits uh, in the new world between around 1500 and 1530 or so, noted that if something was entirely new, we couldn't describe it. But images of the, um, of the moon have been known for, for quite a while. Uh, uh, Jan van Eyck in the 1420s uh, <laughs> uh, painted the moon, great, great precision in both uh, one of the panels of the Ghent altarpiece and also in his crucifixion. And what he showed were these areas. These are the old spots. These are the things that when you look up at the moon, you see the man in the moon or the rabbit in the moon or, or the uh, old lady with the faggots on her shoulder, depending upon your dominant culture. But these are the old spots and they are shown here light, but they are dark, and they are dark because they have low reflectivity. We now know them to be lava flows, and they are known as the seas or the maria. And we also need to remember that the 17th century, geology was in its pre-infancy. And all we need to do is to look at Athanasius Kircher's uh, illustrations in his uh, Mundus Subterraneus to get a good idea of how geology and geologic processes uh, were, were perceived uh, in, in this time. Uh, the age of the world was based on, uh, on historical chronology. We had air, earth, fire and water. Vacuum was still disputed despite Robert Boyle and Torricelli. And there were many attempts to correlate or to understand what we see on the moon with uh, uh, terrestrial, uh, known ter ter terrestrial uh, formations. Uh, this never really quite worked because there isn't good correlation. Indeed, very little seen on the moon has any representation here on earth. It was not really quite appreciated until the 19th uh, 19th century when Phillips uh, did his work. But um, it's interesting to note that the uh, historian of visual solar system observation, William Sheehan, uh, noted that perception is a process of probabilistic knowledge-driven inference. That's sort mm -hmm. of a mouthful, but it, 
but it says everything and it, it will help us put into perspective the uh, the images that I'm going to uh, show uh, as, as we go along. And we're all familiar with the 17th century terrestrial maps. And let's keep those in mind uh, as we look at the lunar images. But lunar images uh, are all through the telescope, which makes them unique. Uh, uh, terrestrial uh, cartography was not done with the intervention of a philosophical instrument, the telescope. It be, um, moon mapping began as making scientific drawings through this instrument. So we need to know a little bit about it. Now the Galilean telescope and all the telescopes of the uh, uh, 1600s of 17th century were um, refracting. They had a, an objective lens here. Light came through and was focused to the eyepiece where it was observed by the observer. The uh, uh, position of the image in the eyepiece uh, is, is uh, and as drawn in lunar maps is totally a function of what telescope was used. On the Galilean telescope, images are upright. With the astronomical or Keplerian telescope, they're inverted or actually rotated. And if we, if when we look at the moon uh, with our naked eye, the top part, we call that north. North is upwards in a Galilean telescope and it's down at the bottom and the south is at the top in an astronomical telescope. This has no real meaning. It's, it, it's, it's not an anomaly like uh, the Munster inverted Europe. It's, um, or, or the East uh, on top, uh, you know, Blau, uh, Nova, Belgica. It's, it, it doesn't matter because in space, there's no North, South, up or down. And when Galileo, who was an artist, really. He was well versed in Renaissance concepts of perspective, shadow, chiaroscuro. Uh, look at the moon. He described very clearly the irregular terminator. The terminator differentiates the illuminated portion of the moon from that which is not. There's no atmosphere on the moon. So the terminator is absolutely abrupt. We have no twilight. And if we look at this region slightly enlarged, we see that Galileo noted that these structures, these spots, now these are the new spots. They're, they're, mm -hmm. they're revealed by the telescope. Um, have shadows in them. And since the sunlight is coming from this direction, he concluded properly that they are concave. We now call them craters. They were not called craters then, they were simply called spots. These are the old spots that we saw in the, uh, the visual diagram of the moon. And these are the new spots. And for a very long time, Everything on the moon was spots. There were light spots, dark spots, big spots, little spots. Uh, Bob Garfinkel noted a very early reference to uh, the term crater. That did not gain traction until the 1790s uh, when Schroeder introduced the term and thereafter we refer to these as craters. Historically, it's inappropriate to call these images of Galileo's, these are etchings that Galileo had uh, commissioned uh, to call these craters, but let's use that term because we all know what it means. Now, we only see things on the moon by dint of their shadow. We cannot see them directly by looking at them. So this creates a very interesting problem. With the sun directly overhead, if we have a peak here, we don't see it because it doesn't throw a shadow. 
if this material of the peak is the same reflectivity as the surrounding terrain, we don't see it. If the material is lighter, it appears as a light spot. If it's darker, it appears as a dark spot. However, if the peak is over here and we have oblique sunlight coming this way, this peak throws a shadow and therefore it becomes visible. We're not seeing the peak, we're seeing its shadow. And we interpret all of the shadows along the terminator by means, uh, uh, we interpret the structures all along the terminator by means of the shadows they throw. Now, as the sun rises higher over the lunar terrain, this shadow becomes attenuated. And this little peak that was in shadow and invisible before now throws its own and becomes visible. So when we look at the moon, we can't see all of the terrain at the same time. The, in essence, as the sun climbs over the lunar surface, it unzips the shadows along the terminator. And it's only along the terminator that we can see lunar surface. So this is, this is an important thing that we we'll see, we'll see later on. Now, following Galileo's realistic presentation of what he saw, there are only four woodblock maps produced. They followed immediately after Galileo's etchings. Uh, they are not naturalistic drawings. They uh, represent an anachronistic abstraction, a uh, pre-Renaissance view of, uh, of drawing from nature. And we'll see that there's a vast different perception of the surface. This is the first of these maps. And these are really rather small maps. These are uh, nine or so centimeters in diameter. Uh, this is a woodblock map by Christoph Scheiner. And he ignores the direction of sunlight. This is not a realistic drawing. It's, it's not realism. It's not drawing from nature. It is really an abstraction. Uh, and it's planimetric. Galileo's was topographic. Uh, it was pictographic, if you will. Uh, and if we do, if we, let's look at this region in somewhat greater magnification. Whereas Galileo showed what we call craters here with the shadows uh, demonstrating their concavity, Shiner really didn't interpret shadows. He was at a loss as to how to do that. And, uh, so instead, we see these sort of random lines of hash marks. The terminator, the irregular terminator, is clearly defined as a discrete line. These are the old spots, somewhat distorted, but uh, Shiner also was unable to give any indication of elevation. So this, this is very difficult to, uh, to interpret. We don't know what these hash marks mean, whether he's implying that this old spot is elevated or what. Uh, so we have a very different visual language than uh, Galileo's. The last of the four woodblocks that I'm going to show, published in 1631. And we see the same thing here, the Terminator, rather clearly defined. But notice here the craters are all little circles. Some are large and some are small. The old spots are shown sort of schematically, but there is no foreshortening. This is a very plainer um, view. The um, the sun, of course, is coming from this direction. And it's clear that this sort of scattering of craters 
doesn't represent the location of each crater. It's simply saying there's a whole lot of, of these things here. And there's no, there's no information about them. We can't tell very much about them. And one of the problems is that seeing something for the first time is, is really difficult. So let's take a, take a break from that and, and, and sneak ahead 100 years. And I'll show you this crater uh, drawn by James Naismith. Crater walls have terracing on the inside and on the outside. And many of them have central peaks. One of the things that's very obvious when you look at the moon with even five powers is the rays system. Now the rays emanate from, largely from two craters. This is Tycho and this is Copernicus. Uh, Kepler is out here and there's some rays coming out of these. Two weeks ago, I looked at the just post full waning moon with uh, eight power binoculars and the ray system was absolutely striking. You look at the moon and the first thing you see are the dark spots and then you, see, you notice the rays cascading across the surface. Galileo did not draw them. They don't appear on the etchings he commissioned, and they don't appear in any of his wash drawings, which is quite remarkable uh, because the magnifications used in, uh, in, at, at this time ranged between eight and a maximum of about 40 uh, times magnification. And the ray system is very, very obvious, and Galileo didn't show it, despite being an artist and somebody who was capable of drawing from nature. The rays were first drawn on what we may call a map or a drawing from nature uh, by Fontana. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, south is at the top. Fontana used an inverting uh, telescope that really, again, doesn't, doesn't matter except for if you're trying to compare it to another image. Um, and he was, this is probably the first map to show the ray system. Fontana referred to uh, this as the greater fountain, and this is the lesser fountain because he compared these to emanations from fountains, you know, fountains spurting things. Um, He also showed that craters aren't simple little circles or ovals. There's a great pleomorphism. And if you look at his craters, they're all different shapes. He recognized that. There are some that are sort of round, but many are oval and some are quite, quite distorted. He also was the first to put central peaks in his craters. He noticed the existence of central peaks. Now, Fontana tried very hard to, to, to describe what he saw. And going back to uh, uh, the, the problem of, of describing something that you've never seen before, finding words, as opposed to simply giving them names. You know, the nomenclature is not really a taxonomy, but we can see that he used some rather uh, curious ways of describing what he saw. Uh, this came back to haunt his reputation later and he was mocked for calling them diamonds and pearls, but he had to use analogy to describe what he thought he saw. Unfortunately for Fontana, he, he published, uh, well, these were these early 1629, 1631 images, uh, engravings were published and disseminated throughout Europe. Every single astronomer in Europe had copies of this and saw what Fontana was doing. 
The book was not published until 1646. Uh, and his later uh, illustrations aren't any better than this. This, this is, he was not a good draftsman. Nonetheless, he described the rays, he described crater pleomorphism and discovered the central peaks and uh, tried very hard to, um, to, to create a, um, a system of descriptors. Uh, he failed at that despite being a lawyer. He was not sufficiently loquacious, but um, we come to a, um, now to uh, an artist, uh, Claude Milan, who was engaged to make engravings of the moon. Milan was a very famous portraitist. He worked with, uh, he, was, he was an engraver and he was, an, he really perfected the ability to create a three-dimensionality by simply thickening and thinning the engraved line. He used illusion, almost visual deception. He never drew anything. We don't see the eye drawn. We don't see the eye, eyebrow drawn. It is all implied. And this is, a, this is one of his, uh, uh, his very famous uh, portraits. And it's a single spiral of a, a, an unbroken and engraved line varying only in thickness to give this, this three-dimensionality. And it, it's very successful in portraits. It, it's, it creates a lifelike image. And everyone can, just by looking at this, can tell that this is the right eye of Jesus. Um, but when he applied the same technique to the moon, we got a very good portrait of the moon. This is about what one would see if one took a, um, a photograph of the moon through, oh, I don't know, a 90 or 120 millimeter telephoto lens. It's, it's quite well positioned, the proportions are correct. The terminator is very nicely delineated. And if the light is coming from this direction, and if we look at this area at higher magnification, and here the light's coming from this direction, we see much like Galileo did, um, uh, a realistic uh, uh, pictorial presentation of what is seen through the telescope. He doesn't really draw the craters, doesn't give crater detail rim, he implies it. And he implies craters here, for example, simply by thickening and thinning his engraved line. Now, if you look closely, you do see thin lines outlining these structures here. Those are probably etched. And these images were all made the same way terrestrial maps were. The, the great outlines were generally etched and then the engraver went and filled in the, uh, the details. So this is very lifelike. But we, again, we see no central peaks. Uh, Milan was certainly aware of them in order to see this amount of detail, he had to have seen central peaks. Um, and he's also aware of, of um, Fontana's work. When he did an engraving of the entire full moon where the sun is directly overhead, like right here, uh, we see nice orthographic projection Everything is in approximately the right position. But is this a map of the moon? Well, it isn't. What it is, is it's a map of reflectivity or albedo. Astronomers refer to the reflectivity of something as, as its albedo. And we see the 
old spots, they're dark. These are the things we see as the man and the moon. We don't see new spots because they're not throwing shadows. We don't, and if we enlarge this area down here, but we do see, by the way, we do see rays because the sun is nice and high and we do see the lunar rays. But let's enlarge this area, look over here. And again, we notice that Milan is using horizontal, parallel lines of different thickness to build up the impression of an image. But we can't see craters because they don't, with the sun directly overhead, there's no shadow. And he has delineated them here for our benefit. But this is, if we want to call this a moon map, fine, but it, 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 it's really a map of the surface properties, the optical, the reflective properties of the material on the moon. It's not a map of uh, of lunar structures. Van Langren, this is generally called the first moon map, and Van Langren uh, made this map with the intention that it be used uh, as a celestial timepiece uh, for uh, determining uh, uh, longitude. Uh, and the, um, again, we see the large, uh, darker old spots, and we see new spots as well, just a few of them. The Maria, one of the old spots, are shown dark in stipple, which is only the second time it was used for lunar engravings. And the craters are so very stylistically donut shaped. They're circular, although they are foreshortened near the limb. So he observed that quite well. Uh, and, and since there's no twilight on the moon, things appear and disappear rather suddenly. And the idea was to see as the sunlight would hit a, a known feature, one should be able to time that and use that as a uh, celestial clock, uh, the same way one, one can use the, um, uh, the satellites of Jupiter, for example. It, it never worked, but it, this really was the first uh, map to attempt to precisely place uh, uh, lunar structures. But notice also that there are no mountains shown. There are only the flat areas, the Mari, and craters. This whole area in here is just filled, it's chock-a-block with mountains, rills, valleys, hills, None of that is shown. Uh, at about this time also, Pierre Gassendi um, did a simplified map for the very same purpose of determining longitude. And I, I will not show that one, but uh, this is a very, very interesting map. Just cartographically, there are only four known exemplars, four known copies of this of this map in existence. Now I show Derrida's map largely because it's the only moon map that mimics the appearance of terrestrial maps. It's the only moon map with a cartouche. <laughs> and it's got a, uh, a banner in the sky, you know, a curious banner in the sky, Excelsior. But it's the only one with a, uh, a cartouche. The map itself is unremarkable. Uh, the craters are shown as little circles. Uh, he reverts to the Bari style shown in the woodblocks. We also have to remember though, that these images were made for an audience that is very different than the terrestrial cartography. Um, there were no publishers of moon maps the way the Blaus had a publishing house to do terrestrial atlases. 
uh, they were circulated, the images were circulated among uh, natural philosophers and there was no great public audience. They were never issued originally colored. So any colored moon map you see from this period has been colored later and many, uh, many maps from uh, uh, Kircher's uh, Mundus Subterraneus, for example, have later color. They were never issued colored. The, uh, and the simplistic presentation of craters just really is meant to demonstrate the fact that these structures exist and they're not meant to be represent any specific crater. And these three things, I've got absolutely no idea what these three things are, but they, they look kind of nice. Um, but we come to, um, to Hevelius, who's a giant of uh, mid 17th century uh, stalinography, lunar cartography, publishing his um, uh, Selenographia. And the, it's, the maps seem to have ignored Milan's realism and the naturalism of, uh, of, of, of Galileo. Uh, but, and we'll see that these, th this is also built up of parallel engraved lines. Hevelius did four large maps. Three of them, P, Q, and R, were used as illustrations for several hundred years. They're very famous maps. Each one has putty in the corner. The putty up the top are holding banners. And the ones down at the bottom have rich iconography. Uh, uh, Hevelius was in a fairly acrimonious correspondence uh, with uh, others regarding the use of telescopic sites in determining star positions. And his, uh, his putty um, uh, represent this um, this argument. So there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of information contained in them. We see the ray system and we see the lunar surface pockmarked with, um, with craters. And we see that he has chosen to use the parallel line engraved system to build up his images. His craters are sort of the donut craters. There's foreshortening near the limb. He recognizes the uh, ray system as being light. And really it's not throwing a shadow the way we see on the inside of the craters. And the three maps, P, Q, and R, these are the large ones. I looked at every single crater that Hevelius engraved, and then there are thousands of them. There are only two that show a central peak. This one, Theophilus, and another central peak sort of grudgingly shown in uh, the crater Copernicus. But what's absent here, as it is in other maps, are the mountains. All we see are the maria, the dark spots, the seas, and the highly idealized, the highly stylized caricatures of, of craters. But Hevelius' map Q, everything is mountainous. And these are the typical kinds of Sugarloaf or molehills that we see on late 16th century, early 17th century terrestrial maps. Um, but everything is shown as, um, as, as being uh, composed of mountains, including, oddly enough, the ray system. Now, the rays have no thickness. They don't cast a shadow. And Hevelius knew that. He showed it on his other maps. 
On this map, he felt compelled to demonstrate them as chains of mountains. And I think what this does is it demonstrates the difficulty that people had in reconciling what they saw in the telescope with what they knew to be on the earth. And never, never saw rays on the earth. So somehow or other, they were described uh, uh, sonographically as, um, as mountains. Now, let me go back to this map. We notice that Avelius shows two hemispheres overlapping. The moon doesn't show just its single face to us. It rocks back and forth and sideways. It wobbles in orbit. So we actually see 60% of the lunar surface, not just 50%, but we get peaks around the edges as it wobbles. And Hevelius shows that here. He shows the extremes of this wobbling, which is called libration. Now, libration is fine if you're just looking at the moon. It doesn't cause any problems, but it, it, it causes fits if you're trying to uh, uh, determine the distance of a feature from the lunar limb. Here, for example, this is known today as Mare Crisium. It can get as close to the lunar limb as it's shown here, or as far away as is shown here. So this is, makes, makes mapping the moon uh, quantitatively very, very difficult. And you'll see that in the 17th century, there aren't any latitude and longitude marks on any of these, uh, of these maps. And this is, a, this is just remarkable. This is the only map in um, Avelius' Solomographia that he himself did not engrave. He did all of the other engravings himself. He also engraved some 20 odd lunar phases. And to, in depicting those, he used a completely different visual language. He did not build up his images by means of parallel lines of different thicknesses, but he actually drew them. And these are, there are very few shadows visible here. This is really, you know, a uh, planimetric map. And it's difficult, the, the Maria cross hatched, and it's difficult to understand what he meant by these varying um, uh, 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 lighter strips of, um, uh, of, of parallel lines. He showed the, this is actually the dark side. This is, this is the unilluminated side. He showed that light in his, uh, uh, in, in his phase images. Now, Hevelius' large hemispheric moon maps were used for several hundred years as illustrations in textbooks and were widely disseminated and widely discussed. His 20 some odd phase diagrams never appeared in any later in any subsequent astronomy or lunar books. They sort of disappeared and partly because his switch of language made it very difficult to understand what, what he was trying to show here. They've sort of gone into oblivion. And what I've done is I've taken uh, high resolution images of all of his phase uh, maps, and they're available to download from uh, mappingthemoon.org, uh, all, all of uh, Hevelius's phases. They're kind of interesting to look at. Uh, they're difficult to interpret. Art historians have a field day with them, though. They, they love them. This is one of the great, wonderful maps. Um, it's entirely etched. Ewan Whitaker, in his 1999 book, which is just a classic uh, mapping and naming of the moon, illustrated it 
but he had little positive to say about it. Uh, and that's because very little was known. It disappeared. It was drawn in 1660 by uh, Montanari, who was best known. He was a very no well-known astronomer. He was best known for determining the period of the variable star Algo. And he's very well known in his, in, in his day. But this map was appended to an ephemeris that was really an ephemeral ephemeris and disappeared. Nobody kept uh, ephem ephemeridae. I can't pronounce it. Nobody kept ephemerises. And it disappeared. And it was not rediscovered until the 1920s. The problem is that Carlo Bonaccini, who discovered the map in the 1920s, wrote it up in an equally obscure publication that also disappeared. It was a publication of an observatory that publication evidently was not kept. It's very hard to find that publication. I fortunately found a copy of it. Uh, uh, I got a copy of it from a, um, an Italian antiquarian book dealer. And uh, that too is up on um, mappingthemoon.org if anyone's interested in it. Um, but if we look at, at, the, at the visual language of this map, suddenly it's not, it's not pictorial. It's, it's not a uh, pictographic map. It's, well, Montanari recognized crater pleomorphism. He's quite accurately drawn. He recognized the presence of central peaks. And he delineated outlines very clearly. He used lines. He didn't imply anything. There was no insinuating, uh, structure it was it was delineating it specifically and he did this by observing the moon over an entire lunation and drawing the terminator as he could see the detail under oblique sunlight and assembled this um uh, this, this fairly large map it's, it's it's quite impressive and i have a a very strong feeling that if it hadn't disappeared, that it really would have had a huge impact on the way uh, lunar topography was depicted over the next 200 years. This, this type of representation was not used again until uh, 1910 by Walter Goodacre. If you look at it closely though, it's very curious because we see outlines but we can't tell whether something is a hill or a depression. Uh, we know these things to be depressions, so our eye tells us this. But there's no way of, of determining it from the language used on the map, even though these are sort of form lines. Um, there's no vertical bottom on the moon. There is no sea level. So form lines are relative to the adjacent terrain. And if we try to use shadows to determine whether something is a hill or a depression, we run into a problem. Here, for example, if this, if this is a crater, the light would have to be coming from this direction in order for there to be a shadow here. But Basically, in the same field, we have a shadow here, which means the light had to be coming from here. And over here, the light has to be coming from here. Montanari did not mean these to be shadows. He almost anticipated hatchures. Uh, they were meant to depict slopes because the sunlight was they're, they're not shadows because the sunlight's coming from all kinds of different directions so they can't be shadows but this is a, an extremely interesting map and unfortunately it disappeared until the 1920s now 
my hero, Robert Hooke, great microscopist, also drew the moon. He had one lunar drawing, this is it. And he employed the Milan technique of horizontal lines to imply structure. For some reason, he decided to use that visual language on the moon when all of his other work, drawing what he saw in the microscope, was very realistic. This is the left eye of a fly. He didn't use parallel lines to build up the image. He didn't use Milan's technique to draw the eye of a fly. He drew what he saw. And if you looked at the fly now, with a modern instrument, you would see exactly what Hook drew. But yet, for some reason, there was a persistence of the Milan style of parallel lines. Uh, Avelius used it, and now Hook used it, and the great Cassini used it. This is a remarkable map. It's a, it's a copper plate engraving. It's large. 63 centimeters in diameter. And again, this is not something one can one can see. If one looks at a full moon, it looks like the one that Milan drew. You don't see, you don't see um, uh, detail, you don't see uh, uh, dimensionality, but it's this was constructed from many, many choreographic drawings done by Cassini that are still. Uh, present in the uh, Paris Observatory. But let's look at this region here, and then at the very tip of this white arrow. We look here first, we see at some larger magnification, one of the big problems of using the parallel line technique to insinuate structure. These are what are known as called today the Lunar Alps, the Alpine region. We can tell they're mountains, but that's all we can tell. There's no finer detail visible. This is the ringed plain known as Plato. This crater is now today known as Cassini. All of these structures are real. They're not imaginary, but we can't get more detail out of this. Just parenthetically, there's a giant valley here called the Alpine Valley that Cassini missed, and it was discovered 30 some odd years later. But however attractive this is, when you look at it at a distance, when you look up close, it loses information. This visual language, <laughs> is very good if you're drawing portraits of people, horses, dogs, but it's not very, really good for cartographic purposes. Montanari's visual language was much better. We can enlarge that and we, can, we don't lose information. Uh, but Cassini at the tip of that white arrow also introduced a profile of his wife. And this is a famous moon maiden. The craters are, are, are sort of the characteristic uh, donuts without much specific detail. But what is important about depicting his wife is that there is a duality to this image. And there's a duality to Cassini's concept of what he's showing. Is it a picture or is it a map? There's a, um, he didn't transform the thing into a Leo Belgicus or a, a Europe as a woman, but there is this, this persistent ambiguity, if you will, as to whether or not what he's, what's being shown is a picture or is sort of a hard nosed map is rather attractive though. It's uh, nice that he put it in. When we come to the last image of the century, Georg Eimert's etching. Uh, this is really done from images by his daughter, Maria Clara. So it's really the first 
moon map, if you will, done by a woman. And it's generally agreed that it's not meant to be an accurate depiction of the lunar surface, but rather it's an abstraction. Um, and if we look at it more closely, clearly this is not meant to be uh, a, 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 a diagram of this surface, but it's impressionistic. And so we have throughout this, the 17th century, we have we start with Galileo's artistic impression, and we end the story with uh, Eimert's purely artistic impression and varying degrees of artistic ability and um, uh, languages, visual languages in between. And it's really difficult to under transfer understanding of terrestrial cartography to lunar mapping. Uh, lunar maps were made for a different audience and the selenographers were either independently wealthy or well positioned. There was not a map trade for them, uh, nor was there a general, general market. But they began at a discrete time in history, and we can be we can follow them from that time and see how, how the experiment went. There's a lot of rich detail, though, that I've not touched upon. For example, uh, nomenclature and taxonomy, and there's a lot of interesting uh, evolution of uh, uh, eponyms from Van Langren through Riccioli, and the attempt to use the map as a celestial uh, timepiece. The instruments are fascinating. Uh, telescopes were very, very difficult to use, and they still are. So we have to appreciate the fact that it's an extraordinary accomplishment to, to do, to make, to capture these images. These telescopes are, are hard to use. Take, take a pair of binoculars, let's say a 10x binoc, and try to look at the moon with it by holding it up. You've got to have a mounting for it. It's, and that becomes very complex. It wasn't until 20 years ago that telescopes became relatively easy to use and didn't require this huge amount of tacit knowledge. Now, we end the story with a question. Are they maps or are they pictures? And if we look very carefully at the images, we see both. We see attempts at mapping and attempts at pictorial representation. And I end with this woodblock uh, from uh, Schadel's uh, uh, Liber Chronicarum of 1493. And um, he's sort of a pensive fellow, and I think that's a good way to end. Thank you, Frank. Uh, from my perspective as a sort of a land lover, uh, this was very informative and instructive. Um, I, there are several questions in the chat. I think we should go to those. Uh, my first thought was, how widely available were telescopes? And, and I think you probably touched on, the, on this at the end, how much of, a, of what you're seeing in the maps was original observation or copies or hypothesis? Everything on the maps that I've selected were original observations. These are not copies from previous maps. Interestingly enough in, uh, in selenography, every, every selenographer began with a blank hemisphere. I think I can click end of show. Well, I'm afraid to click anything else or something, will, everything will disappear. Um, the, um, every selenographer began with a blank slate and put his own observations in. There were no mother maps 
until uh, the uh, 19th century when the Beer and, and, and uh, a Madler map uh, was used as a basis for building uh, additional information. N very little of it was fantasy. They were attempts to, uh, to show what they saw. Now, availability of telescopes is another issue. Galileo actually perfected the telescope. It was around, it was known before Galileo, but he was also a master craftsman and was able to create lenses that gave him reasonable definition. Most of the images were made with telescopes ranging from 10 to about 30 magnification. The practical upper limit of magnification in the 17th century was about 40 times. So these are not high magnification images. Telescopes were, good telescopes were very rare. They were exceedingly expensive. Uh, one of the Medici's wanted a telescope from Galileo and he really kind of dragged his foot because uh, they were very hard to make, they were very scarce, and he really didn't want to give one up even to, to his patron. So there weren't very many, and there were fewer still people who were both good draftsmen and good observers. The amount of tacit knowledge needed to use one of these telescopes was, was pretty staggering. Okay, uh, here is a question from uh, Angel Abud. Was it the first telescopic map of the moon, a drawing made by Thomas Harriot, who observed the moon through a telescope four months before Galileo in August 1609? Yes, it was not published though. Uh, Harriot, Harriet's drawings which are still in existence, uh, were, 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 not, were, were never published. His later drawings are probably based on Galileo's observations, but Galileo's uh, were the first published disseminated images of the moon through a telescope. So the fact that Harriet looked at the moon and made drawings before Galileo is really interesting. On the other hand, um, they they weren't known. I don't. I forgot when uh, when they were discovered, but they had no influence whatsoever on subsequent um, uh, selenography. Okay, two comments or questions from Nick Canas. Hevelius also included a full moon Vauvel in his atlas for calculation purposes, comment, and then excellent talk. Could you comment on Riccioli's lunar map? Yeah, Riccioli's lunar map is best known for the nomenclature that was used which is basically the nomenclature used today. There were two competing nomenclatures at the time. Uh, the earliest one uh, was, 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 was pretty much discarded. So we had Hevelius's and we had Riccioli's. Uh, Hevelius named gave names to lunar features based on terrestrial names. He thought it would be a lot easier for people to remember something on the moon if it had a name of something on the earth. Riccioli uh, used a, a king, uh, had a different system of nomenclature. He named things after philosophers, scholars, natural philosophers, uh, historical figures. And he had something like over 200 names 
uh, most of which are still in use. Uh, uh, maybe one or two of Hevelius's are in use today, but the two systems competed uh, for about a hundred years and the competition was largely uh, Catholic versus Lutheran. <laughs> the Lutheran uh, astronomers tended to, uh, to stick with Hevelius's nomenclature for a while. Uh, uh, the Southern European astronomers tended to stick with uh, Riccioli's. Uh, and for a period of time, some uh, selenographers used both. There are examples of maps in the margins that have, have both nomenclatures side by side. So the, um, the Riccioli map is, is, is really the first one to use modern, uh, modern names or names that are used in modern times. And that, of course, that's, that, that, it's, it's, a, it's a different issue than the visual languages. And uh, it, it has to do with really, what do you call things? You know, they just as easily could have called the crater uh, uh, Clavius, they could have called it Fred. It really doesn't tell you anything about that structure. <laughs> it wasn't until uh, geology became somewhat more sophisticated and there began to be uh, uh, hypotheses about uh, how these structures were formed that you began to have a, um, a more rigorous taxonomy, the sort of thing uh, that poor uh, Fontana tried to do very early on. Okay, um, Nick also raised a procedural question about how, uh, where would this video of this presentation be available? Uh, the video will be made available in the members only section of the Washington Map Society website. Uh, if others of you are interested, we will share it with uh, Frank and you can get in touch with him. Uh, question from Tim Weiskel. Your key, key question was, are these maps or are they pictures? He adds, actually humanists would say they were, they are both. They are not presentations, they are representation. that is representation. What do you think? Yeah, they are representations and part of their appearance, and I didn't, I didn't touch on this at all, part of the appearance of these different images depends upon their mode of reproduction. Galileo, and I think it was in his haste to get um, his book out, chose to have his images etched, which can be done rather quickly. But etching, woodblock, and engraving are very different procedures, and they give different appearances to things. So part of what we see is process dependent. Part of what we see is how good a draftsman somebody was. And part of what we see is what was their intent? I mean, were they trying to be constable and, and, and draw a pastoral scene? Or were they drawing from nature? And I think most of them were drawing from nature. Uh, the way um, uh, <laughs> way people who did botanicals or anatomies of the time did. Uh, and Montanari is really the only one who, who tried to use a language that was less ambiguous. I mean, it's hard to, it's, it's hard to argue that Montanari's map was anything but an attempt to, uh, to depict this, to, 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 to map the surface. It wasn't pictorial. So yeah, they have, it has elements, elements of um, 
of artistic representations. And yet, as I show in this last slide, uh, for 400 years, uh, people have been calling them uh, maps. So I suppose we all know what's meant by that. Uh, it's only when we dig deep that we begin to question whether or not what we're looking at are drawings from nature or are they maps? Okay, okay. Um, we're running sort of late. Let me do one more question. Thank you for an informative, this is from Roberta Stevens. Uh, how exciting it must have been to see the emergence of the moon's features. Did they understand what the cre what created the craters and the crater peaks? One word answer, no. They had no idea what these craters were. There's nothing like that on Earth. So the tendency was to consider them volcanic. And volcanism was the mechanism that until, you know, un until World War II, um, was generally considered to be the geological formative uh, power that created uh, cra uh, craters. The central peak and um, um, James Naismith, who was a great proponent of the volcanic process, considered them to be crater cones. Uh, the crater erupted throughout the lava that formed the walls of, of, of the crater. And as the volcano died, it left its, its cone. Now, when you look very closely at the moon with a telescope, very few of these central peaks have pits at the top. They aren't crater cones. The slopes of all of the um, uh, central peaks and of the uh, sides of the craters are unlike volcanic crater cones, volcanic craters. They're more like the uh, subsidence craters one sees in Hawaii, you know, Mau Mau, for example. But um, there was some indication around the early in the, in the 20th century that uh, they were impact craters. And it wasn't until Baldwin, who was a physicist, I believe, and who worked with uh, the military uh, and did quantitative studies uh, and calculated the energy of, of um, impacts that it became clear that these are impact craters. And an impact crater will very often have a rebound and the central peak is, is the rebound from the displacement of, of the thing that, that gets hit. The rays, of course, are ejecta from these impacts and there's no atmosphere, so they travel hundreds and hundreds of miles. Um, a lot of the craters have polygonal outlines and that's very common in impact craters. We see that in Meteor Crater here in the United States. That's a polygonal crater. But Baldwin's uh, quantitative work, I think, sealed the fate. And of course, uh, it's now it's pretty well uh, ascertained that these are impact uh, craters, that the Earth at one time had them, but they all got eroded. But at the time they were observed, there was absolutely no reference point. Uh, what, what do you call them? And when Schroeder called them crater, he did not mean to imply that they were volcanic craters. He used crater as a synonym for cup. Uh, in other words, a, a cup-like depression. But sometimes these words get 
acquired different different usage. Schiaparelli, for example, uh, used the term canali for the lines that he thought he saw on Mars. That got translated to canals, and then Percival Lowell ran with that one. So the term crater, as used by Schroeder in the 1790s in his Cinematographische Fragmente, did not mean to imply anything volcanic, but it came to it came to mean that, uh, and um, until uh, well into the 20th century, volcanism was thought to be the uh, uh, the cause of, of these structures. Sorry, that was a long-winded answer. Okay. Um, so for the people who may have other questions, would you mind giving them your email contact? Um, yeah, it's, uh, let's see, let's, the, the one that I generally look at is just office at fmanasek.com. That's one word, fmanasek.com. Okay. So I'd like to thank you. We usually have some gifts for the speaker. Now these are more of an earthly uh, cartographic representation. And one is a set of note cards for, of Washington DC, uh, reflecting the fact that you spoke to us as the Washington Map Society. And then two cut line map images of the states of Vermont and New Hampshire. Oh my. <laughs> I, I try to get the city you're from, but I'm sorry, uh, this particular firm doesn't, uh, what is it, Hanover? Well, right now I'm in Hanover. Uh, okay. We also live in Norwich, Vermont. Okay, well, they they just didn't have maps of those cities, so you'll have to be satisfied with the state. Okay, I it is getting late, but uh, I guess if we could open the, uh, room for maybe about five minutes of conversation. Well, thank you very much. That's really splendid. I really look forward to that. The uh, maps of Vermont and New Hampshire are, are, are particularly uh, dear to our heart. We, um, we have very fond attachments to this area. Well, thank, thank you, Frank. That's 